Okay, we are live here on DallasWeekly.com. Um, we are talking with Charles O'Neill, David Shetcher, and Nicole Wavers. David and Nicole are from WFAA, uh, who recently released a story about banking under I-30, uh, revealing some secrets and some not-so-secrets about the practices of banks in the Black community and Brown community. And Charles O'Neill is with us. He is the former president of the Dallas Black Chamber. He is the current uh, chair of the U.S. Black Chamber. He is also an established businessman, has been an advocate for the Black community for over 30 years. Thank you all for being here with us. Pleasure. Right. Thank you. Well, let's get right into it. So, David, you were doing some research and found out that some banks are literally denying access to capital to the Black community. How did you start this uh, journey? And give us some of the things that you found out during it. Thanks, Patrick. It's, it's great to be here. I think, like most good stories, it, it was probably 10 different things before it became the thing that it finally did become. Um, but the step that was critical was meeting James McGee from uh, Southern Dallas Progress, who told us that about something called assessment areas and the Community Reinvestment Act mm -hmm. of 1977, which is kind of like civil rights law for um, you know, for finance and said that banks had to engage in their communities and reinvest in their communities, particularly in low to moderate income areas. He told us about these maps, these assessment maps that were supposed to be essentially squares for Dallas County would cover the whole county and any bank that operated in the, in the county would have to serve the whole county. But he had his, he had seen a couple that were chopped up. We call them butterfly maps. They just didn't look like a full, like a full square and and they were starting to cut off at i-30 so they were saying we're going to serve above i-30 but not below uh, so we decided nicole and jason trahan and our team we decided that we were going to get all 105 maps uh, of all the banks that operate in dallas county and look at those and look at their maps and what we found was 20 percent of the maps cut off basically cut off uh, below i-30 and then when you started comparing banks that serve the whole county versus banks that just cut off at I-30, the banks that cut off at I-30 were borrowing at much, were lending at much lower rates to Hispanics and African-Americans. So we thought that was a story that we just had to be telling. Mm -hmm. So Charles, I'm going to ask you a question I kind of know the answer to, but uh, does any of that shock you? Well, <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking about this. Thanks for great, great, great lead in there, uh, Patrick. Um, uh, it's it's almost it's astounding that that this is like oh wow look what we discovered right this is what's been going on and I always like to throw in it's been going on at least since I had a big fro right and so 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 so, so it's it's not new at all you know um, and it is distressing because. Um, because lives are being impacted by these policies and practices, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yes, for the last, as long as I've been in Dallas, nearly 40 years, people have gone without mm -hmm. as a result of these policies. And so businesses are impacted, like your story with Robert Petrie and, and others, clearly the Dallas Weekly, for that matter, mm -hmm. had difficulty of attracting financing to a going concern. And so, um, so it, yes, it, it is disturbing that, that in 2020, we would be discovering mm -hmm. that there is this glaring disparity in lending practices by financial institutions. And so uh, it is something again, that folk have like Robert have advocated for Robert Petrie, that is uh, the Dallas Black Chamber of Commerce, uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of business owners who have uh, been impacted negatively by these policies and practices. And so while it's always good to have new lights, new new eyes and shined on the problem uh, without some uh, resulting change in the way these practices. And, and it's really interesting, and then I'll be finished for this for this question, but just this session, uh, legislative session, uh, during pre-filing was last week, first day of pre-filing, and Senator Boris Miles from Houston filed a pre-filed bill that is essentially a Community Reinvestment Act bill for the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. um, it will die in committee. There's no question about that. It won't see the light of day, but it, it just, again, highlights 
how glaring the disparities are and the need for enforcement action uh, from a legislative perspective. And so uh, uh, we, we'd like to think I could go on and on and on because uh, the city of Dallas has had its handprints over, over this inequity for decades that I'm aware of. Uh, a former mayor, Steve Bartlett, um, left his congressional seat and served as the uh, CEO of the Financial Services Roundtable, which is the uh, umbrella organization for all the big banks in America. Those that were <laughs> conducting these disparate acts of lending. Uh, Jeb Henselin was a congressman from Dallas. Uh, spent his, nearly his entire career attempting to uh, repeal the Community Reinvestment Act. And so it's not like these things happen in isolation. There are folk who are actively involved in, in ensuring yeah. that this level of disparate impact continue. And so, so the despair that you feel from Black folk who get just totally exhausted over having to revisit this issue is not because we're loonies or not because uh, we're playing the quote unquote proverbial race card. It's because there are policies and practices in place to enforce a system that disallows access to capital. Nicole, you wanna say something? Yeah, I was just gonna jump in because it was just interesting. I feel like when you were talking about I, I want to know more actually about the the Texas legislation that you were talking about because I'm interested in that. But then also it was just very interesting when you said that, you know, it's going to die. It's not going to go anywhere. It was all, I almost heard like a little bit of like resignation in your voice that like this is just kind of what happens. And I, I feel like throughout the like reporting for this story, that's that's kind of been the response sometimes that even surprised me was that you talk to people about the issue and there was a. Uh, just an acknowledgement, like, this is how it's been. These are how these things are done, um, which is why um, I, I, I want to give David Schechter props for bringing me in and letting me participate because they actually started this story and said, this is what's happening. And it it really, it's like the type of issue that needs to be like dug into and sh uh, a light needs to be shown on it because I think there's a little bit of that response is a was it's just a little bit disconcerting to me as somebody who's not from originally from Dallas, um, just because it's kind of become like this is just how it is. But I'm I, I would like to know more, I guess, about what is being done at the state level to to kind of shine a light on some of these practices or prevent um, actual well, redlines, uh, hope, redlining, that type of thing. I hope that I'm sorry. I, I hope that you didn't hear resignation. No, 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 not, not, not in that way. But, but just a, just a, just a kind of acknowledgement of like those are like, and yeah, that's never it's, getting it's out been of this committee. Way. Yeah, that's yeah. never getting out of committee. Uh, yeah, uh, it's it's never getting out of committee. You know, and and just think about it. We got Dan Patrick. We got Greg Abbott. It's yeah. never getting out of committee. I testified on a bill last year, not related to this issue, but. Uh, it was about increasing uh, access to opportunity, that is contracting opportunities for black folk. And there's a state representative in 2019 that says, well, what's wrong with doing something for white men? Right. So, so, so we know that legislation that, that on its face will result in positive benefit for non-white folk in Texas is gonna be stillborn. That's why we're doing gerrymandering. That's why we're doing uh, disparate impacts of health care. It's because there's this ultra right wing element in the legislature that's saying, not on my watch. And so clearly those things that impact access to capital are a number one. They're saying, no, we're not giving them access to money. You know, uh, our whole act, uh, the thing that we do at the Texas Association of African American Chambers, I like to think is ultimately quality of life work. That is, if black businesses are more profitable, have access to capital in which to conduct their business, they change lives in the communities that they serve. And so if, if there is an opposition to what we propose as one fix for the economic uh, disparity in communities across Texas, that's prima facie evidence that there's folk who say, I don't care what you're talking about. 
I want it to stay the same as it is. And that's not the, uh, and Texas, this is what is particularly galling to me. Texas has the largest black population among the 50 states, right? Texas has led the nation in the rate of business formation for two decades. And so, so we got 350,000 folk who present themselves as business owners and they can't go to a bank. <laughs> That's crazy. Yes. That 350,000 business owners supports three and a half million people. Right? So that is an entire state's government that says, and I've told Governor Abbott, hey man, you govern like black folk don't exist. You know? And so, so if, 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 we can see by the policies and practices used by these financial institutions that they don't care if three and a half million people starve, literally and figuratively, then we got a problem that is at least daunting, you know, and and, and it won't be Patrick and Nicole and Charles that get it fixed. David as a voice to an entire other group of Texans that must be alerted to this issue. So it ain't black folk that got to get it fixed. Right. White folk got to fix this. It's them that, have, that, that support these policies, you know, and the, and them ultimately when there's 19 black folk in the state legislature, 17 in the house, two in the Senate, two out of 31, they're not going to win. 17 out of 150, they're not going to beat anybody by outvoting them. And so it, it, if they don't get allies to support a change in legislation, yeah, we'll be talking about this when I got the real Santa Claus beard thing going, right? <laughs> Charles, can I, can I, I want to speak to what you said because a couple of things like, so I think there's a, there's that sort of duh, you know, like this is happening. Well, duh, we all know that. Um, and I think, um, you, you know, there's a reality of living that every day and knowing why well, I can't go to the bank because they're not going to give me a like I know that everyone knows that, and I I I, th I hope what we we may be brought to the table in a, you know, in addition to I think caring about it is that um, is evidence is new evidence uh, because I think that's very helpful because I, I think you know we had a very strong reaction on Twitter to people talking about this because there's new some new documentation to prove it. It's sort of like the science end of things. You could have a theory and then you have, I want this, maybe theory is the wrong thing, but like you have to prove it out and then, and then check your proof to see if that holds up and if that works. So I think what people seem to be reacting to is not a, just rehashing that this is an old problem, but it's actually an existing problem, continuing problem. And we found the documentation that shows that. And, um, and I think we had a lot of white people involved in the conversation, similar maybe to what kind of the people getting involved or waking up this summer to to seeing to seeing things for the first time that they hadn't had. And I'm you know I've seen a lot of things for the first time. I didn't I know they were there, but I wasn't looking at them or I didn't know where to look or I wasn't asking the right questions. So I hope that's part of uh, what I'm seeing that. And what I think what you're saying is right. It will take a coalition of people more than just black folk to say, this is a problem. We need to fix this. Um, and you can't ask the people uh, who, you know, if we made the system and we got to fix the system, we can't ask you to fix a system you didn't make, I think is pretty critical. Uh, I'd actually like to bring that to a little, little forefront because solution based um, stuff is what we're all trying to you know, dive into. And I am uh, about 38 in another couple of weeks. Ugh. And um, I've seen, I mean, obviously I grew up in the business of the Dallas Weekly. I have seen business in Dallas being conducted my entire life. And just like Charles, I would have said to you, if you had asked me before your story was, hey, is banking in Dallas fair? I'd be like, absolutely not. There's a definite red line at I-30. And I think we talked about that in our conversations about the story. But I was interested to find out that um, when people don't know about it, they do get shocked and there does seem to be some kind of reaction. But historically, that reaction has been, like Charles said, stifled by the powers that be because they understand how the power system is supposed to work. So my question is, in your research, um, we say 20 percent of banks. And I thought I saw the thing. It was mostly Dallas based, Texas based banks. 
But we know as a black community nationally, I talked to my father-in-law who was in Philadelphia, who does nonprofit and business development up there. He was not shocked either. He was like, I'd actually like to see how that works in Dallas because it definitely works up here like that. And this is one of the up, up north, east coast, liberal towns. Definitely there's there's processes going. So I know I'm long winded. In your, in your research, did you find any correlating data or evidence that pointed to banks acting like this on a sort of a national level, meaning I know Wells Fargo's gotten in trouble about racial issues every other year um, since I've been at the Dallas Weekly. We get ads because of it. You know, I know that we'll get a slew of ads when the CEO of Wells Fargo let it slip out his mouth that he don't like black people or something like that. And I thought, OK, then you look at how Wells Fargo practices banking in the black community and you realize, oh, we're getting charged more, higher interest rates, yada, yada, yada. I wouldn't imagine it's any different for any of the other banks. So uh, once again, long winded, was there any data points that said this is definitely happening on a 20 percent across the board? But it looks like it's kind of kind of hitting these other places because of larger banks, national, international banks. And I mean, this could also have global implications with how international banks deal with, let's say, the African continent or Caribbean islands, et cetera, et cetera. High populations of Afro descended peoples. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'd say. In particular, when we did the pass through the information, <clears throat> none of the, the, the huge national banks, their, their, their maps uh, were at least all to the county level. Mm -hmm. And so um, that was the filter which we were using for this story. And so they didn't pass through that filter. And you're right, the banks that we were finding are, are more local or regional. Um, and, and so that's the direction that we went. But when you think about a story like an investigation, like being a, you know, like a bullseye or something, what we found is some stuff around the outside still mm -hmm. and the bigger banks um, and maybe Charles, you could help us get to some specific, you know, actionable information, but the bigger banks are much more involved in the life of this community. They're making more loans. They're making more decisions about loans. And they're actually, some of these smaller banks are, are primarily business banks. They're not making hardly any mortgage loans, and that data is not even public. You know, the business loan data is not even public. So we ended up going in the you in, know in, in a path where we could go, but I think we'd certainly like to know because Robert Petrie said, "Hey, there's a, there's a, a big national bank right down the street from me, and everybody knows they don't lend anybody any money." Mm. That wasn't in the reports that we were looking at, and we'd like to know that though if we could get to it. I don't if you have any thoughts about that, we'd love to hear them. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the uh, one of the short term fixes is increasing, and it's, it's real bizarre. But one of the things you would think that we would increase the number of black bankers. Yeah. That is folk that that without resorting to empathy. That is folk that knew they felt it, experienced it themselves. That they would be able to uh, make lended decisions based on what they see, what they know. Yeah. Well, uh, I won't say five years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago when banks started going to uh, 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 computerized underwriting practices. That is, they removed the underwriting from the local institutions and went to shipping off your application to someplace in Phoenix that they didn't know you. All they saw was a zip code, age, rank, serial number, that kind of thing. And then they made a decision. And so uh, until um, there is some return to personal banking, that is, I know Patrick Washington, I know Nicole Wavers, uh, they're cool people, they're trying really hard in their business, we've been able to look at their data from their business, we can make a loan based on our understanding, our knowledge of them without this, this ephemeral presence out in cyberspace someplace making that credit decision based on FICO, which again is an arbitrary standard that does not take into consideration that Charles O'Neill lives in Dallas, has lived in the same house for 35 years, blah, 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 no, you know. And so they can't make a credit decision, a credit or lending decision based on their knowledge of me. Right. So that's one short term deal. So there are very, very, very few uh, entry level lending positions made available to black folk who majored in banking and finance. 
when they are engaged or hired, they're hired as relationship managers. That is, they can approve a check for cashing at your local bank branch, but they can't make a loan decision. Again, they take an application, assure you that it will go to the same place that everybody else's loan application goes to. And when you get a rejection notice or a decline notice, they tell you these are the steps that you can take to come back and see us again in six months or so. And so that's that's one thing. But again, the, the regulatory oversight, that is, again, those that I referenced, Financial Services Roundtable, which is the big association that governs how banks do their business, um, uh, Financial Services Committee in Congress, um, and uh, Texas Banking and, and Insurance Committee in the Texas legislature. Those are the things. And then the public pressure from reporting like you've done, David, uh, like uh, Patrick and uh, Weekly does every day, uh, is going to be what really tells the tale. And so, again, I, I, I will say that, uh, well, this conversation is a result of your reporting. And so shining new light on it is good. Uh, but it, it really begs there to be some resulting <clears throat> positive outcomes. Yeah. And speaking of, David, like we were talking about um, your hopes that this is something that is resonant in the community that goes further. I believe that it will. And your hope was that this is a this is a national implication story. I mean, if this is happening in Dallas County, it's probably happening in counties all over the, the country. Um, with local banks, maybe even national ones. And so how did you think that it would get to the DOJ? Like, do you think that it's just the information alone is enough? Or do you think that it's going to take some some more Charles O'Neill, some more Patrick Washingtons to say, hey, let's keep talking about it until something ultimately happens? And caveat, I know we're, we're in a transitional period in the yeah. administration of the country. So do you feel as though it's even... I only I, I guess I have to say it like this. It's even worthy of having the conversation right now or waiting to really scream about it after the 20th. Uh, well, I think it's worth having the conversation. Now, and I'll share this too with Nicole if you if you want to join me. Um, <clears throat> I think one important thing right now, so there's a couple things that are going on that are really valuable. the The CRA is is uh, being essentially will be rewritten by the um, the Federal Reserve, and they're in this 120-day comment period, and they've proposed all kinds of changes to it, and they're getting pretty good reviews for for it. But no one's in that convers. No one in this space is in that conversation. It's very bank heavy. It's very uh, regulator heavy, and I think that there is an opportunity right now for this community, for Dallas County, and any community, to say we want to be part of that conversation. You guys are rewriting the rules. It's a great time for us to tell you what's how this is not working where we live. Mm -hmm. And um, in particular, a concept of the community getting together and saying, uh, the minority community saying, these are, these are, this is what we need. We need, I know James McGee says 20,000 units of housing. Here's things that we need in this community. And then on the other ends, the banks, you'd say to the banks, let's work on that. We don't, you know, Financial literacy is an important course for mm -hmm. uh, to some level, but how much credit should you be getting for financial literacy versus helping us build, you know, loaning the money to build some of this housing? So um, I think I think right now somebody in the minority community, and it's probably James, needs to lead this conversation to say, we want to have our day in front of the Federal Reserve. We want to talk to you. Here's what's going on. And then I also think, you know, and we'll be hopefully talking to Eddie Bernice Johnson's office that a convening of powers that be in this county and say, what is happening and what's happening here? Uh, we, I need to hear from everybody so I can understand that she's written some legislation in the past. She's tried to amend the CRA. She cares about this. So I think getting her to the table um, and would be a would be a powerful voice. Nicole, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I definitely think like now, like right now is like gathering is like the time to like determine what it is that you want. Like what are what are our expectations? Um, and then, like David said, bringing them to the powers that be that are discussing the changes right 
for the like the next round of like the revamp CRA, like what that looks like. Um, I also think that the reason why I say now also is just because of, like the organizing is probably going to be really key and the messaging, like what does Dallas really need? What does Southern Dallas really need? Um, and so having the organization and the research and the data that you need to really present and, and, and kind of a unified voice amongst different groups that are already in this space, because the stuff that we found, you know, we went to the, um, oh, Help me out, David. The in oh, the NCRC, the yeah. NCRC. Yeah, yeah. They're already in this space and doing that work. James is already in this space and doing that work. And so, like bringing those different players together and having um, a unified message and a unified. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Charles. <laughs> but just having a very unified <laughs> message um, that's clear and. Um, and, and and easily digestible because some some of the stuff is, is that, that I learned about is just so layered and so what do we really want and and having all of the evidence to back up like this is why we need what we need and this is really what's going to change things I think it's really important and so that that has already you've already been doing the work for years but like in this moment you have like a special opportunity I think to really um, use the even the megaphone that that we have like I feel like that's that's the thing is that once it's organized outside of WFAA, then that's follow up for us to say like, okay, this is actually happening. Like we did this reporting and now what's happening in the community? What is the community's response to this? And that's where our megaphone comes in um, because it's our job to make sure those issues are at the forefront if they're important to the community. So. I think, um, you know, it's the wrong time to get just cuckoo wonky about the deal, but if, if folk understand how the policy making process works, um, while it, it, the, the advocacy and the, the organizing and the, and the loud voices necessary uh, are arrayed against uh, the, lobbying, the sheer yeah. lobbying power that is money, yeah. that is representative of financial institutions. Um, ne nearly everything that needed our needs continues. The needs to be addressed vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, these lending practices was contained in the Dodd-Frank banking regulatory reform bill, right? It resulted in the Com Consumer Protection Financial Services Bureau, right? And that was the one piece of legislation during the Obama uh, administration that reduce the amount of usurious uh, interest rates could be charged for all kinds of loans. Right. It immediately went under assault. It immediately began hacking away at it. It immediately began trying to repeal key pieces of it. And Rich Cordray was thrown out summarily as soon as Trump was installed in office. And so they beheaded the organization and then started tinkering with the machinery that was the legs up under it. And so while that was a, 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 a clear piece of beneficial legislation that was enacted and it, it couldn't it was not supported by um, an understanding of how you were a, how you're able to maintain the structural integrity of a piece of legislation. And so, uh, again, if we use the same math formula with 46, 47 black folk out of 435 in the Congress, their voices were just mute. They were, okay, that's, there's old Clay up there in Missouri talking about black folks' issues. Okay, there's Ada Bernice, there's Sheila Jackson Lee down in Houston. You know what she's going to say. Yeah. And so, so we get those kinds of jaded responses. And so without this big, uh, and, 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 and we've had institutional uh, responses to it. The NAACP, Legal Defense Fund, the Urban League, all testifying in Congress, the U.S. Black Chamber testifying in Congress about these very, very, very trenchantly held uh, insistence on maintaining the current operating environment. So uh, 
What's it, a win? What What does a win? What's a win look like? If you could get a win right now, win, I, I, I win the whole game, but like a win right now. I don't want to miss here. Just like Nicole, Nicole saying, "I'm we need something just like we did for George Floyd." Yeah, you know, we need to go out in the street and say, "Come on, man, come on." We got people literally starving to death. Now we can't go out there without a mask, you know, but we got to go someplace and say, "Look, we have your." practices on full display what you do every day denies me access and this is this is the one that really makes me sit up late at night i can't even go borrow the money i have in the bank mm. Huh. Mm. Oh. okay <laughs> that so, uh, <laughs> you know that's man yeah that's uh, uh, robert i talked to robert just last week and, and we, we just find ourselves same place sometime and, and robert had a 200% collateral, he was asked to, 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 he was denied a loan with 200% collateral. Jesus. That's crazy. And so, so I mean, literally, uh, it, it's so, so, and, and, and that resulted in a lawsuit, of course, but, you know, he ended up having to go out of state to get money for the same thing that he was denied, uh, 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 alone here in Texas. And so uh, I, I think, again, conversations like this exploded, uh, expanded, you know, uh, young, active folk who, who, wow, man, I didn't know that was going on. Here's what we can say, but keeping it in the public uh, sphere um, makes my job easier, certainly. So selfishly, I'm saying, please bring it on, you know, but, but, but we have to um, and maybe maybe this puts it better in context. There's 350,000 black folk who sit there in business, but there's three and a half million, 10 times as many people who are not in business. And so they're not impacted necessarily by their failure to access capital for a business. They can go and get their check cash, you know, and they can go use their ATM card without much problem. But, but those of us who are in business, are those that are impacted. And so that's a, a smaller subset of the entire population. And so uh, how you elevate those voices is what we're hoping to solve here. I mean, so so we really, really, really need the loud voice. We need WFAA, uh, you know, to keep screaming it, you know, and, and, and to keep uh, putting pressure again, again, on those people who are, are going to have to be engaged as allies. You know, they have to say, oh, my God, I didn't know it was that bad, you know, and, and they, they have to rally to uh, this problem that, again, if, if, if you put it in context, that, again, the denial of access to capital for black owned businesses results in increased unemployment, increased demand on social services, increased criminal activity. And so if you if you. Uh, juxtapose the net benefits that when black businesses are profitable, they're able to hire more people. When those people hire people, they pay more in tuition, they buy more cars, more washing machines, they pay more in taxes, again, driving down the cost of living in a municipality, blah, 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 blah. If folk understand the correlation between uh, Patrick growing his business to $60 million on the corner of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, or the uh, or metal and Malcolm, Malcolm Martin, Luther, Martin Luther King is is a net benefit, right, to the entire southern totally. half of the town, right? So, and it's it's you said something that I feel like I screamed from the rooftops for uh, a while, like, and I'm sure you've been screaming all your life for long, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but um, I I feel like that's the part where I feel like the disconnect is sometimes is that there's some idea that if we have to, that if, if, if you give some groups something access or that you're going to deny another group. Yeah. Um, and so I think there, there isn't like a common understanding amongst like everybody that lives in Dallas proper, everybody that lives in Dallas County, everybody that lives in Texas, that, giving access to um, capital, capital and investment, 
those things are a benefit, like you said, to everyone. That is yeah. that is good for the entire community. And I feel like that's where the largest like fundamental philosophical disconnect is, is that there's some mm -hmm. idea that if you deny to some areas that it's gonna, so, it's so, so we can keep it, we can we can stay here if we're right. okay. Um, but it really is beneficial. Robert Petrie, the, the, I think the most powerful thing that he said in the story was what he said, I guess it was 30 years ago or 20 years ago when he said, talked about the crime problem and the poverty problem and all these other problems that those things are, those things are completely linked. They're interwoven and you can't really pull them apart. And so I, to me, that's, I think that's where that understanding, if there's a, a, a message that can be brought to people, that's it is that you are helping the entire health of the community. I apologize, there's construction happening. This is the world we live in now. <laughs> um, <laughs> that you're helping the entire community. You're, you're, right. It's not just, it's not a us and them. It's not, it doesn't have to be a below and south of 30, that it's about Dallas as a whole. We have like one of the largest wealth gaps in the country, but we can have an like a bit a society that's beneficial to everybody. Like we can we can have a city that's healthy and thriving no matter where you go. That's more housing options. You don't have to like we have to be in our little corner because there's more housing. There's there's great schools everywhere. You have a, a larger selection for you and your family. So yeah, I would echo all of that, and I want to thank you all. I'm going to try to wind it down. I want to take a couple questions from our social media, and then have you all have some closing remarks. Um, I want to start by saying, hey, thanks to everyone who has been watching our social and um, engaging with us. Um, Miss April Bradley had some questions about credit unions. She believes that um, in practices of credit unions, there can be the same practice. She doesn't have evidence, but she was wondering if there was anything that led you to believe that this might be happening within the credit union sphere, too. The, so the, the Community Reinvestment Act does not cover credit unions. Mm. Uh, it also doesn't cover any mortgage lending companies like Rocket Mortgage or any large. So uh, there is a belief that the CRA actually is is should be extended to a larger variety of financial services. I can imagine what that fight would look like in Congress, Charles. <laughs> but, um, you know, you only have these regulated banks, which are a small portion of the overall lending. Um, so that's why we didn't cover uh, credit unions, because they're not part of the law. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, and credit unions uh, have the. Sh uh oh. Uh, yes, they do the same things that everybody else does, but but they have the cover of of membership in their defined community of interest, and so uh, the National Credit Union Association is the governing body uh, for that ostensibly uh, determines how credit unions respond to their to their lending activity. But for the most part, credit unions uh, are limited in the kind of lending they do. And so they do more home improvement loans, more consumer loans than they do business loans. And so um, not as overt as big financial institutions, but the same practices prevail. OK, OK. Um, we do have a lot of thanks and um support coming out. Jay McGee says, thanks for continuing the conversation. Um, Miss Messia Davis uh, also is appreciative, but would also like to know, this is an open-ended question to the group, but do you guys think that there are some uh, group of people that are uh, purposeful in their suppression of people of color uh, accessing capital, or is this just a ingrained behavior that is a result of a racist system? Yeah, it's an it's an easy question to answer. <laughs> Obviously, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I I from my from from just from what I see, I think so. People make their own biased decisions at the one on one level. I'm a bank officer. I'm not going to give you that loan, um, and those may filter into policies that a bank has. I think the banks in general are looking at them, trying to draw these maps so they can make the most money possible, and they're they want and so they want to serve a certain area. Um, and I think in terms of their practices, if I had to put more blame, I'd say it's on the regulators. The, the, the rules are there. The regulators are not making the banks follow those rules. 
and then the banks are just trying to compete with each other. And if that bank gets something easier then the other bank comes in and says, Hey, I want what that bank has. And so this playing field is just moving all the time. Um, and, and I think that is systemic racism. That's how that system works. Like I said to Robert Petrie, do you think there's just some dude sitting in a room saying, we're not going to do this? And I don't think that's really how it works. It's so much more complicated than that. So I, the bad, it's hard to say that a bank is a bad actor per se when they are trying to take advantage of the system and reward their shareholders, but they have responsibilities to the community and they get FDIC insurance and they're not just any, any business who so they can just decide who they want to serve. So, and maybe, maybe Charles, you see that differently, but I think that, that I think it's really a question of regulation uh, on the practices of the banks more so than just the bank's actions. Well, if I, if I will devolve into my newspaper man here. Um, um, the, the real issue is uh, I've, I've grown comfortable calling it just providing the context if all of our conversations about the intractability of this this problem are are approached from the perspective of white folk who have controlled the system then there's no way out you know and so so if there are guys sitting in a room someplace saying hey man how's it going you holding up pretty good absolutely there's folk who saying is it working for you yes absolutely it is going on yeah because that is what they've determined makes them money. Yeah. Do you understand? And yeah. so unless we're able to right size the deal by saying, wait a minute, man, uh, whatever it is you're doing is not working for me. Yeah. And we need to change it so that it works for me. And then he'll say that oh, banks are very, very comfortable saying, oh, it just takes too much work to make a $50,000 loan. It takes the same amount of work to do a five million dollar loan, so we just do five million dollar loans. You know the PPP deal in this whole United States, seven hundred and fifty thousand plus loans over seventy five thousand dollars. Hundred and forty six black folk got those loans. Hmm. Okay, hmm. you can't uh, you can't do that accidentally, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you have to purposefully do that in order to maintain the status quo. And so unless we are really, really willing to up in the system. Now, I'm not saying, you know, let's go blow up everything. I'm saying that you have to say my perspective, my experience is legitimate. And again, I, I always underscore with this and I'm paying for it. See, you're using my money to beat me with. Yeah. That, man, come on. That's like a schoolyard bully. Give me that quarter, man, every day. Yeah. You know, and so so if we're able to engage a conversation with the true interest in, in, in a change in behaviors and a change in the way financial institutions conduct their business that results in more access to capital for Black-owned businesses, we will then see a sea change in everything that we talked about, Nicole, in performance in education, performance in access to health care, everything changes. And so I don't, uh, you know, yes, there, 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 there are people whose <clears throat> whole deal is, are you holding the line today? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I will. Uh, there's a comment that I'd like to mention. I'm going to turn it into a question, but it'll be my last and then I'll, I'll wrap it up. Uh, Mr. Daryl Chris Herbert is mentioning the zoning issues that come out of this, this conversation. He's mentioning that in the county where they're fighting warehouses that are uh, on zone land for residential uh, and things like that happening as a result. I think that's very interesting. I like to say that what are some of the impacts beyond, like we've talked about education, crime, uh, and David, you can answer this and Charles and Nicole are able to answer this. What are some of the implications you found that this practice has? I saw a stat recently um, and I can't remember the exact number, but it was something like $14 trillion is lost because of racist practices in America, a capitalist society. And now we're seeing what you said, banking practices in, a, in, a, in, a, in the black and brown community have now created 
a system which we have more crime, which we heard the mayor talking about yesterday, which we'll get into that later. Um, we have educational issues. We have, you know, um, public housing and things like that, all that could have been resolved with lending some folks some money or investing in a community. Were there any kind of glaring um, issues that you saw that stemmed out of this practice of uh, redlining? I don't know if I'm even equipped to actually answer that question very well. Um, I would say um, I am more in the process of observing and learning and trying to see those things. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think a lot of that would be would be linking, you know, what you're learning with what you've lived. And I haven't lived that. So it's hard for me to say, but I think I think the lack of investment is so ob it's just obvious. Um, and, and the, you know, it's like not having oxygen, um, and all the implications that that would have, but I, I, I don't, I guess I don't feel equipped maybe as well as others to answer that. Works for me. Anyone else want to take, take a tackle yeah. at that? I, I, I would say the, I, I couldn't say like that there was like a specific thing that I could think of that is like directly linked. I think that when you when you see the lines drawn though that's just what popped out as a person who like i said is not from here who came here and said i moved to dallas and i went and i would be invited out to dinner and we would go uptown or something or we would go to um you know off mckinney or something like that and so you go and you walk down streets in that area and you look around and there is something that you notice it looks very nice and then Later on, I decided I needed to get hair products. And so I had to travel south of 30 and I saw something that looks quite different. And so I think like, I can't think of anything like specific that like necessarily jumped out. I think it, 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 as we kind of have already talked about, it just added weight to what you can see with your own eyes when you go, when you, mm. when you travel south, there's something that looks different. And why does it look different? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, um, I always like to heart back. My first, my first foray into this, oh, 1982, I was in the newspaper business and the Dallas Black Chamber needed someone to serve on the city of Dallas Economic Development Advisory Board. At that time, the Dallas Chamber was the uh, contracted economic development entity for the city of Dallas. So we met, meet at the Dallas Chamber's office and they had a, a literally an entire wall is a map, right? And the bottom border of the map is I-30. Yeah, <laughs> seen that map. You know, and so, so I mean, it was just like wow. something that doesn't even exist. So, uh, again, I, I appreciate the conversation today, and I appreciate the work that you guys at WFAA are doing to highlight the deal clearly, the energy that Robert Petrie has brought to the deal. Patrick, what you and the Weekly are doing uh, we just got to have more of it. We got to have an amplified uh, response. I think the public at large and particularly the black public needs to understand better uh, how these rules and regulations are promulgated, uh, how they are in fact uh, sometimes used to uh, subvert <laughs> the intent of the legislation. And that's an interesting concept that needs exploring too because uh, we have seen uh, legislation offered that solves all of the things that we've talked about. And then when it's passed into law, it becomes something very different. All right. And so we, we just have to get more attuned to, uh, uh, of how the sausage is made, you know, and, and that's a, that's a, that's a difficult long-term kind of process, but, uh, the, the heightened focus on it, uh, the energy uh, like we have seen uh, for criminal justice issues have to be applied to economic justice issues as well. All right. Um, and just to add a little bit to what Nicole was saying, for Nicole being new here, uh, we have our wonderful partner, Carrie Mitchell from Dallas Free Press, mentioned that that whole area of Uptown used to be State Thomas, uh, St. Thomas. And that was a historically Black community that right. was uh, turned into Uptown after That's some money was lent to developers up there. Um, so just bringing it full circle. <laughs> uh, but um, for 
David, you, you have a tip line or something that if somebody wanted to get more information, tell their side of the story into this, how could they uh, get that get that information to you? And uh, we're going to have the link too, but could you tell everybody how to yes. do that? Well, there's a it's a, a a real brief survey. We're asking people to say, you know, have you had have you had dealings with banks that um, left you feeling like something what didn't go right there? Um, we'd like to follow up with get some more personal stories and also find our way, like I said, to this closer to the middle of the the bullseye um, with larger you know entities. You know, and I know those are the those are the places that you're going to have people are going to have experiences with because they're already in the community, I'm assuming. You know, I, I went to my large bank, my large branch bank, I don't know if I said that right, and here's the experience that I had. So we'd like to hear about some of those experiences. Um, so I guess Patrick, you'll share that link. And I would just yeah. add with the like two thoughts for me, as Nicole knows about me, I'm just, uh, I really like, like big audacious projects and ideas and goals. And I do think, I do think it would be helpful to say, uh, Southern Dallas uh, is is our goal is ten billion dollars in new business investment in ten years or five years or whatever. I'm I'm just making that number up, but like people need a, something to shoot for, and I know the NCRC has been successful in the past of getting trillions of dollars of investment that wasn't flowing previously. So I I like the idea of you know a goal. I don't know if that makes any sense, and people can sink their teeth into that and i think people would like to report on that like we would love to report on that that might be stupid that might be pie in the sky and the other piece is i think there needs to be a convener here i think someone uh, or, or multiple conveners to like we're not gonna as journalists put together a conference and say we're bringing eddie bernice johnson to the table and we're bringing yeah and need, someone needs to sort of start convening these conversations and i we're gonna cover them and i i, I think all of our peers are gonna cover that as well i think Everyone's ready to do that now in a way that they weren't ready to do it before for whatever reason and a lot of bad reasons previously. And I think maybe some good reasons now. Okay. And Charles, if somebody wanted to get involved with some of that um, on the street work with the TA, AAA, double C or the U S black chamber, how can they get in contact with them? Uh, US black chambers.org or tech that tech T three A's two C's.org is our website. Uh, Give us a shout. Send up the bat flare, the black bat signal, man, and I'm all in, right? But uh, USB, usblackchambers.org and tech.org. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you all for joining us for this conversation. And uh, David, Nicole, and your team, thank you all for just doing the research and the work and putting it out in the public. Charles, thank you for joining us and bringing your knowledge and expertise to this subject. We will continue this conversation uh, more. We will hope to do that convening process. Uh, in the near future. You can find this and more stories at dallasweekly.com. Of course, follow the link to WFAA story. It is now currently up on their site, on our site, on our social, on their social. Please share it, like it, keep it going. Um, and we will bring this conversation up again. So thank you all once again, and we thank will you. see you later. Thank you, thank Patrick. You. Thank you. My pleasure. Mm -hmm.